This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. I worked last year on a little Christology that uh, we talked about. And uh, it was five things that people say uh, because Jesus did them, that means he had to be God. Five things. And uh, we talked about those five. I thought uh, we might pick up where we left off a little bit and talk a little more about uh, Christology and, and talk about these common things you often hear people saying, well, Jesus did this, so he has to be God. Okay, that's, that's kind of the thought we're working on. And we're looking at uh, five more of those things today. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look and hopefully there'll be some. First of all, before we look at the five specific things we want to look at today, uh, let's see if we can kind of understand this. I know we, we do here in this room, but, but the idea is Jesus had to be God or at least a God-man. You ever hear that language? He had to be that in order to do the things he did. So what we're looking for is what are the easy answers to these questions and how can we help our friends to better understand what we're saying about these issues and about Jesus? And uh, one of the uh, key thoughts in this, I think, is this. Uh, note that the common language used by Christians to say he had to be God or he was God in some sense, that that language is not actually biblical. Now, that, that's interesting. Uh, like the phrase God-man, that gets bandied about quite a lot. And it's interesting, but our friends might be surprised to learn that that's not a biblical term. God-man is made-up language. It's not Bible language, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. It's just not there. Uh, two natures, that Jesus had two natures, that's not there. This is post-biblical language. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, dual nature. You hear that sometimes. You know, sort of same sort of idea. How about this one? That he was fully God and fully man. Ever heard that one? Uh, we know that he was a man, but when you're a man, you don't say, are you fully man? We don't know. Are you, we don't know if you're fully man or not. But, so you don't have to say fully man. They didn't go around in the Bible saying fully man because he was a man. And then, of course, he wasn't fully God or God in the sense of the eternal God at all. Isn't that interesting? So, again, all of this is non-biblical language. And sometimes it's helpful to note that. When you've developed such a body of, of terms and words and phrases to express what you're saying, you have to begin to wonder after a while, well, wait a minute, none of this terminology is in the Bible, then maybe the ideas aren't really there either. We need to take another look at that. There is an underlying issue here, I think, that applies to all these things that we so commonly hear our friends out there uh, who are uh, talking about Jesus had to be God because uh, he did this and he did that and he did this. Uh, he, uh, you know, he walked on water. And that's, that's truly amazing. But we shouldn't forget that Moses parted waters. How did Moses do that? Did that mean Moses was God or partly God or fully God and fully man or something? I don't know what that means, right? Uh, Jesus did raise the dead, right? But so did Peter. Remember the case with Dorcas? How did Peter do that? Was he partly God too? Or do we realize those people, including the man Christ Jesus, were not doing those things by their own power, their own abilities. They were doing them by the power of God Almighty who was working with them. What do you think? So uh, I think uh, that's really the underlying issue with all these kinds of, this particular type of question uh, that we're dealing with. And, uh, and there's a verse that we learned last time, we should be reminded of at this time as well, that uh, I think applies almost universally to all this, and that's John the fifth chapter and verse 30. Anytime some, well, Jesus had to be God because he, John 5 and 30. <laughs> it just seems to work all the time. But in John 5 and 30, uh, I think 
the NIV translates it, uh, by, by myself I can do how much? Nothing. That's such a wonderful, beautiful, universal statement uh, that it just applies over and over again. So Jesus walked on water. By myself, I can do nothing. Wow. He raised the dead. By myself, I can do nothing. He rose from the dead. By myself, I can do nothing. Wow. You see, you see what I'm saying? This type of reasoning runs headlong into the problem of Jesus' own declaration about how he did stuff. He never once ever said, I do things because I'm God. He did, never said that. He said, I do all that I do because my Father is working in me. Not that I am Him, but He works in me. He's with me. Amen? So, wow. Once we have that in mind, we can begin to answer, I think, satisfactorily, rightly, all this kind of reasoning that says, well, he did this, so that means he had to be gone. So we're going to look at five more of these things today. Let's see what we can gain uh, along this line. So this is actually our first reason of the day, but it's actually reason six in this little series, as it turns out to be. And that is, and people often uh, say this, well, he was Lord. If he's Lord, that means he's God. Ever heard that particular thought? I, I have uh, a number of times, and people actually think, well, if he's Lord, that means he's God. But does that really work out? We should never, uh, as I like to say, never overlook the obvious. And what's the obvious in this case? The obvious in this case is there is not one verse in all your Bible that says, because he's Lord, that means he's God. The connector isn't there, is it? It's not connected. So sometimes we have to remind our friends, you're creating a connection between two things that the Bible itself never made. So what is it? So what does it mean? Jesus was Lord, but what do we find about that? We find in Acts, the second chapter, in verse 36, he was Lord because God made him to be Lord. Right. Wow. Nobody makes God to be God, do, do they? I mean, what, how, that makes no sense. That's not a scriptural idea. And so we're not saying that because he's Lord, he's God. We're saying he's, he is Lord because God made him Lord. And as we like to say back in my part of Tennessee, then if God had not made Jesus Lord, would he have just been Lord anyway? And I don't think he would have been. What do you think? No. So Acts 2.36, a very important verse. And it, it can really help uh, folks to understand what we're saying about that. And keep in mind this too. This is pretty uh, simple to understand, I think. I was thinking about this the other day. I never really thought about it. But when they were calling Jesus Lord back in the Gospels, do you think they were really saying in their minds, all of them thought they were calling him God? You know, when Jesus said... Uh, in uh, Luke 6, 46, he said, why call you me Lord, Lord, which they were doing, and do not do the things that I say, right? Remember that? Well, do you think those people really meant, why, was Jesus saying, why do you call me God, God? No, Lord doesn't mean God, for goodness sakes. None of them were thinking that because they were calling him Lord, that meant they thought they were calling him God. But, Lord, uh, they called him Lord a lot. And uh, no one ever indicated that that meant they thought they were calling him God. Doesn't, doesn't work that way, right? And when it says he is Lord of Lords, is that saying he's God of gods? That doesn't make any sense, does it? No. Lord means what? And you can look this up in any good Bible dictionary. It's not hard. Uh, but look it up. And, and, and Lord simply means what? One who is over others, higher than others. You know, the, that, that's uh, the sense of one who has power and authority, things like that. And Jesus is over others and higher than others and has power and authority. He's Lord because, Acts 2.36, God made him Lord. Ha! 
What do you think? Not, not bad then, was it? Not to mention then that you can also show your friends examples in the scripture where others were Lord. And, and not, I mean, like in a bad sense, they were Lord also because God had made them Lord. Not to the extent God has made Jesus Lord. He's given him to be over all for, uh, for the kingdom of God and for eternity. So that's, that's pretty terrific. But these nevertheless were Lord. You can, you can find in your Bible where Saul, the King Saul, was called Lord by David. More than once he was called Lord. Uh, David himself was called Lord. Was that wrong? Were they calling those guys God? No, of course not. So when we begin to take a look at it then, we realize that Jesus is Lord. But according to the Bible, if we want to use that as our standard, and I think we should, that doesn't at all mean he is God. What do you think? So this is not too hard, is it? I think that's pretty easy. I like uh, 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 the easy things that are not real hard to understand, not hard to communicate, and maybe uh, people can be benefited by the easy things sometimes and uh, uh, to help them to understand. This is not so hard. I think that's it. Well, okay. Reason number seven of the 15 that, that I've chosen, probably you can come up with some more, but 15 things, Jesus had to be God because he did this, that, or the other. Okay. The next one is, he is the Christ. He's Christ. And Christ means he is God. Now, I know that's strange uh, to you who are in this room who are not information-deprived people. You, you know that doesn't work at all. But I have run into folks uh, who often have told me, well, you know, the fact he's Christ, that means he's God. Well, that is the under-informed folks, unfortunately. And, and you can help them to understand this, I think, pretty easily. Did you know this is the most used word in Christianity that I have found and the least understood, and that's the word Christ. What do you think? I would say that if you were to poll Christians and you were to poll them out of a hundred, every hundred you polled, I don't know if you'd hardly find any that knew what the word Christ means. As we've said before, I think a lot of Christians just think that was his last name. And, and as we've said, it's not as though uh, Joseph and Mary Christ you know, got married and had a baby or something. It's not like that. This was not just a name in that sense. It may eventually come to be kind of applied in that way. But this, this is okay. But the word Christ meant something, didn't it? What, what did it mean? Of course, it, it meant one who is anointed. What's the Hebrew equivalent for that? It's Messiah, Mashiach, right? And Messiah, then, uh, you'll find in the Old Testament, Christ, Christos in your Greek New Testament, same thing. It just means one who's been anointed. Who got anointed? Who got anointed? In, in, uh, in the Old Testament, we find a lot of examples, don't we? Uh, the kings of Israel, like Saul, we mentioned earlier, his king, he got anointed, right? <laughs> he was anointed by Samuel. And then uh, David uh, was later anointed by the same fellow, right? Same prophet of God, Samuel. So they were anointed. What did they do when they anointed? Them? They poured a flask of oil probably on their heads. And it, was a, it was a very powerful uh, uh, thing to happen. And it indicated God's blessings and approval and, and dedication of this person to God's purposes and work. I think that's wonderful. Hey, uh, there was another category of people that were anointed too. Uh, uh, not just the kings, but the, uh, how about the high priests? Remember Aaron when he was anointed? And those who uh, came along after that were anointed. So they anointed the high priest. So when we come along, and back then, it's interesting, those were, uh, as, it, as it was, those people were anointed ones. That's where the understanding really comes from, and, uh, the, uh, and the Word comes from. So in the New Testament, then we find Jesus coming, and what's so unique about Him is He is anointed also. Actually, I think He was anointed, but anointed by God to be both king and priest. Isn't that interesting? Because we know He was both. And God did not actually entrust the anointing of His Son 
Jesus, to, uh, to one of the prophets or any other intermediary, did he? God himself anointed Jesus. How did he do that? How did that happen? Well, uh, he anointed him not just with oil, which would be beautiful and nice, but God anointed Jesus with Holy Spirit and with power and glory. That's extraordinary. So actually, and we find that a very language being used by Peter in Acts the 10th chapter in verse 38. And that's really good to remember on this business about Jesus being Christ and what that would mean. Uh, so Peter uh, is telling the folks at the household of Cornelius, he says, you know about Jesus, and he says uh, how that uh, he went about and doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil and uh, because God was with him. But he says, you know how God anointed Jesus with Holy Spirit and with power. And then he went about doing all these things. So isn't that interesting? But now, uh, uh, on this business of him being anointed, being Christ, and by the way, he's not just any Christ. <laughs> he's like Lord of Lords, but he's Christ of Christs, if you will. He's Christ of Messiahs. He's Christ of all the anointed ones. Uh, and uh, we find again in Acts 2, verse 36, and this is just too beautiful. Peter is saying to the people, listen, people, uh, I want you to know this. This Jesus that you crucified, God has made him, we quoted it just a minute ago, Lord, right? That's where we understood God made him Lord. But what's the rest of that statement in Acts 2.36? And Messiah. God has made him Lord and Christ. Made him Lord and Messiah. Made him Lord and anointed. Isn't that amazing? That's beautiful. I, it's so unfortunate that uh, uh, our, our Bible teachers and ministers in the land are not teaching people this basic fundamental about what it means for Jesus to be Christ. So maybe if someone says, well, I think he, he's Christ, that means he's God. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. If you're Christ, that means with all certainty you're not God. God has need for no one to anoint him with anything. Okay? He, if he's the anointor, not the anointee. Okay? He's the one who anointed Jesus and made him Lord and made him Christ. So what do you think? This isn't too hard, is it? Is it? Yeah. You know, I think sometimes we uh, get a little befuddled when our friends come with uh, questions and issues, uh, our neighbors and people in life. Oh, well, you know, I, I even read in a book, this is really kind of sad. But you have this theologian writing in a book. I've still got the quote somewhere. And he's saying, well, you know, whenever it says he's Christ, that means he's deity. That means he's God. I thought, oh my lands, this is so sad. And it is. So no, never forget the obvious. Not one scripture in the Bible ever said because he's Christ, that means he's God. What do you think? So I. Okay. So he's not God. He didn't anoint himself. <laughs> he said, makes no sense. Okay, well, what about reason number eight in the series then? I often hear this, and it goes something like this. Uh, Jesus had to be God because they worshipped him. I mean, if you didn't worship him, then, I mean, if you, if you were going to worship him, you couldn't worship anybody but God, so that means he had to be God if you, if you worshipped him. And, uh, but again, this kind of fails, doesn't it? Well, we do know that he was worshipped. Absolutely. I mean, this is certainly true. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about what that would mean. But did you ever find a verse in the Bible that said because he was worshipped, that means he was God? No. That connection isn't there. So that's the, the part that we have to keep in mind as we look at this type of, of thinking and misunderstanding. Uh, because these ideas are misunderstood. Jesus had to be God because he, and then fell in your blank. This time it's, he was worshipped. That's not, that's not true. That's a misunderstanding. He was worshipped in Matthew 28 9. Remember, after his resurrection, his own disciples came and, and they worshipped him and they held on to his feet. And I think that means they were, what, they had prostrated uh, uh, themselves before him and are holding on to his feet. Isn't that interesting? But it's a very high form of honor. 
uh, to so bow to one. Now, by the way, it would be uh, abominable and absolutely unacceptable that they would ever bow to any false god or bow to uh, anyone saying this being or person or thing is God Almighty. That would be horrible. Never. That was your three Hebrew children, right? You don't want to do that sort of thing. But they did bow before and honor those whom God had made Lord. And those who were the, uh, the kings of Israel and the anointed ones of Israel, they did bow before them. And that's what is missing here. People don't realize it. So you can find a variety of examples of this. Uh, in uh, Genesis, the 33rd chapter, and I think beginning in verse 1, you find where that Jacob bowed before his brother Esau uh, in honor to him. Remember Joseph's brothers uh, when they came to Egypt. They wound up bowing before Joseph, their own brother, to show him honor and respect. Didn't mean they thought he was God. Just because you bowed before someone or showed them that kind of honor or high respect doesn't mean, it just means there's somebody way above you who, who you want to show special honor or respect to. It's interesting, you can find an example, of this. I found this the other day, it's kind of interesting, how that when uh, Bathsheba, Solomon's mom, came in to see him one time at court, uh, he, uh, he got up and he personally bowed down before her, his mom. He's the king and he's bowing before his mom. Does that mean he thought his mom was deity or something? No. And was there something wrong about doing that? Not at all. They showed such honor to God's kings. If they showed such honor to God's kings, then how much would they show honor to this king that God has established to be king forever? Jesus, Lord Jesus. Messiah anointed Jesus. Uh, sure, I think so. So there's a lot of other examples. Uh, there's examples of, of uh, David bowing before King Saul and others bowing before David. And they called him Lord and, and so honored him in that way. So this type of bowing or obeisance doesn't offend God it, it pleases God. God wants uh, his people to be subject to those whom he has established to be their rulers, their leaders, and so on. And actually, that's the story with Jesus too. How, about, how many of you know, remember in, in Philippians 2, talked about how that uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, Lord not God, that Jesus is Lord. And this is going to glorify somebody. Who, who gets glory out of this? God, to the glory of God the Father. So this is really wonderful, isn't it? It's also, I don't think it's hard to understand, but there's been so much misunderstanding on some of these issues. And you, you'll even find these things in books, you know, sometimes. Theologians are writing these, this kind of misinformation. And that's sad. It's unfortunate. People deserve better, don't they? They deserve to know uh, more uh, uh, about these kinds of things. So it's, it's really uh, crucial. So it would be terrible to do this, I think, to bow before David and think, I'm your God, David, so I'm bowing before you. That would be a horrible misunderstanding and uh, be really terrible, wouldn't it? Or to bow before uh, King Saul, same thing. Or... If you bowed before anyone saying you're God Almighty, now that gets to be a problem. That is an offense to God. They bowed before Jesus saying, Oh Lord, the Lord God had made Lord. <laughs> the Lord that God had established to be Lord. So yeah, they did bow before him. But I think to bow before Jesus as though he were God, you run the risk then of saying or worshiping him as though he were God. You run the risk of... of violating what? The first commandment. You shall have no other, no other gods before me. One said that. One, only one person said that. One being, that was God Almighty, God the, the Father. Don't have any other that you're calling God before me. As I look down on you, don't want to see you worshiping anybody else's God. So that would include David or some, or even our Lord Jesus. Right? It's to the glory of God that we would so bow for Jesus and honor him. But only if we're bowing before him and honoring him because God made him Lord. God has made him to be king. God has made him to be anointed 
the one he anointed to lead his people. Not for a while, like David did or Saul, but forever. Amen? Yeah. So it's not, not too hard, I think. This is really good. Reason number nine, then. This, I, I hear this quite often. And again, I, I think it's a misguided way of thinking. But it's a, Jesus had to be God, or a God-man, in order to resist sin. Have you, have you heard that raised at times? Sure. And you read that one in books as well. Which, which, you know, they had a, an old saying, uh, you say, uh, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. Nowadays, they should say, you don't believe everything you read on the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the equivalent. But, uh, but really, uh, we shouldn't believe everything we read in books, even when it's written by seemingly educated people. Many times they are. Uh, but yes, and sometimes theologians of note, but they have, you know, as, as we say here in Tennessee, sometimes uh, they've grown up from the time they were in knee pants thinking about these things this way. And then later on when they become more educated and theologians and they become really smart, they, they devote their smartness and their, their efforts as uh, in terms of education and all of that and their work into proving what they always believed since they were in knee pants. Do you see what I'm saying? So, you know, we, but don't, don't we need to grow up sometime? Don't Christians deserve better from our teachers? Don't we deserve to know what the Lord really means? And don't we deserve to know as Christians what the word Christ really means? What do you think? Or, or the fact that they so honored Jesus by bowing before him or even prostrating themselves on the, on the ground at times before him. This great high honor. Don't, don't Christians need to know or deserve to know that such high honor was often paid to high people, to very high officials? Now some, some, like Peter, he didn't want Cornelius bowing before him because Peter's saying, I'm nobody. But now to bow before the king whom God has chosen, yeah, you want to do that, wouldn't you? doesn't mean he's God. The king is God, for goodness sake, because God is the one that did, again, the determining that he'll be king. So here we are. Did Jesus have to be God in order to resist sin and be sinless? And I think here again, there's an awfully big uh, disparagence, a problem between this thought and the Bible, because not to overlook the obvious again, there is no scripture in the Bible. You, you don't have to worry about this. If you were a betting person, you could bet the farm on this. It's, it's no problem in saying there is not a scripture in the Bible that said he had to be God in order to resist sin like he did because he was perfect in resisting sin. And you know, human beings can't do that. So he had to be God to do that. Not one verse in your Bible. Not one verse in any Bible that is uh, doing a, any reasonable job of translating the text at all it will say such a thing. Not at all. So let's think about it again. He did resist sin. We know that. He was sinless. He was without sin, the scripture said. He was tempted in all ways like as us, but yet without sin. So that part is true. What's untrue is to connect that and say, well, therefore, he must be God, you know. Well, you know, I don't know. Here's, let's go back to the original fellow, Adam, for just a second. Think about him for a minute. Here's Adam, and Adam at least didn't sin for a while. I don't know how long. I don't know how long he, he lived before they sinned. It may have been the second or third day he and Eve were in the garden, or it may have been a long time, years. Does that mean that for those years, Adam was God? I don't think so. We, we find uh, that just because one didn't sin would not necessarily mean that they were God at all. In fact, what do you think? I think that we would know that they didn't sin because God was with them. What do you think of that possibility? I, I think that's true. Uh, again, our, our verse that we keep looking at, what does Jesus say about the stuff he did? John 5 and 30. By myself, on my own, I can do nothing. 
I would suppose that meant resist sin. I would suppose that would mean remaining sinless. He couldn't do that on his own any more than you or I could, right? The very fact that Jesus was tempted like us proves he is not God. Think about it. Because here we are, uh, James, the first chapter, verse 13. He, uh, God doesn't tempt anybody, right? But what is the key there? God cannot be tempted with sin. So the very fact that Jesus is tempted establishes for our friends immediately Jesus was not God. God can't be tempted. No, I wouldn't think so. So, uh, so this isn't so hard either, is it, as we, as we think about that? Uh, Jesus can do nothing of himself. He resisted sin. So we know then he didn't resist sin by his own abilities or power. John 5 and 30. Good, good verse to keep in mind as you look at these kinds of reasonings that you sometimes run into from our neighbors and friends. And uh, so you can help us say, well, you know, if I could resist sin for a day, would that mean I was God for a day? You know, how does this work? No, see, it would mean probably that I was walking like Jesus walked depending on God that day. You know, so uh, I think that uh, as we look at these things then, we know that Jesus resisted sin and was sinless because he relied so completely on his Father. And this is the, the opposite picture then from what we saw, what we talked about a minute ago, in Adam. Adam didn't sin for a while either, right? For a while. We don't know how long. I don't know how long. But he didn't sin for a while. Didn't mean that he was God for a while. It just means that he did not sin for a while and the blessings of God were with him. God communed with him and even the garden and so on. It was wonderful. But uh, what Jesus did that was so wonderfully unique was he trusted in God throughout his tenure, throughout his time. And so that was wonderful. So we're not talking about whether you could resist sin or not being the key, but how long you can do it, right? And how long did he do it? He did it to the end of his journey, his, his work uh, for the Lord. So what do you think? Uh, that's not too hard, is it? He had uh, wonderful help then. I don't do these works. It's the Father who is in me, with me. He does the works. I do nothing of myself. I can't, I can't do anything of myself. And I would assume that means resist sin. What do you think? Okay. So, uh, so that's good. What about uh, this one then? Number 10. Did Jesus have to be a God-man? or God in order to be our Savior. Because I hear that thought a lot too. And as I've said, you'll even read some of these uh, misunderstandings in books. You'll, you'll read them written by theologians, for goodness sakes, who should know better and should be informing the people more accurately about these various issues. And, well, a man could not buy our salvation. Once again, not to overlook the obvious, always look at this, this point before we go anywhere else. Is there any place in the scripture that says that because Jesus is our Savior, therefore he had to be God? That connection is not there, is it? The connector's not there. So we should help our friends to realize, well, I understand what you're saying. But the problem I have is I don't know of any scripture that actually says that. And we're thinking about, okay, he's, he's Savior. Well, we have scripture that talks about God being our Savior. You know, so that, that's true. And then we have uh, scripture that Jesus is our Savior. And then that's wonderful and true. First uh, Timothy 2 and 3 uh, calls God our Savior. And, uh, and that's beautiful. But, uh, but Jesus is our Savior, and there are scriptures that do talk about that. Uh, just because Jesus is Savior doesn't mean he's God. Because actually, uh, just like these other issues we've been talking about, Somebody made him to be savior to the people. He, he didn't just decide, hmm, you know, what am I going to do in life? I think I'll save mankind. You know, so, you know, it, it, it looks like it was a job that was pretty well open. Nobody was doing that. So I think I'll go for that. That's not what happened. So Jesus says in John 5 and verse 30 that he could do nothing on his own. He could do nothing by himself. And I would assume that would certainly mean being the Savior of mankind. So God is our Savior, but 
he has accomplished his salvation by sending us a Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. The anointed Jesus. So, and did, God did this, uh, didn't he, in, uh, in Old Testament times too, in, in many ways. Uh, Nehemiah 9 and I think verse 27, where it talks about how they cried out to God when they were in trouble, the people, uh, Israel did, and how that God sent them saviors. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, sure. Well, did that mean that they were God? I don't think so. Well, was God not the Savior then? Because God sent them saviors. These saviors are our saviors, not God. No, God has accomplished his salvation by sending them saviors, right? Yeah. Say, well, yeah, but Jesus is a greater Savior than all of those. Well, that's wonderful. He is. What God has caused him to accomplish and what God caused him to do is greater than what those other saviors have did. You know, but we're talking here about degrees of salvation and what they're accomplishing. Not the fact that they're saviors, but the, these fellows back there uh, that Nehemiah, we find that being talked about there, they were saviors in some ways, and they were. Jesus is savior in, in even greater ways. But that doesn't mean that he's God, and it doesn't mean that God is not still God. God is, and God is ultimate savior of us all. Uh, is that hard? Here's a verse you can think about on this. I think uh, Acts 5.31 it's nice to have verses that just flat out say what you're, you're thinking about. But in Acts 5.31, God exalted Jesus to his right hand. We know that now. Uh, Jesus is exalted and sitting at the right hand of God. The great theme of Psalm 110 and 1. And the great theme of the New Testament, really. He, he exalted him at his right hand as a prince and a savior. God exalted him to do this. God exalted him to be, what, a prince. God exalted him to be savior. And, and what is he going to do as savior? To grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And, uh, and that's the business of reconciliation, right, that Jesus is in right now. He's reconciling the world to God. And God's reconciling the world to himself through Jesus. Acts 13, 23 uh, speaking of David, but it talks about of this man's seed has God, according to his promise, raised to Israel a Savior, Jesus. So from among David's descendants, God has raised up what? A Savior to Israel. And he names him. He's Jesus. So I think this is beautiful. So isn't the man Christ Jesus our Savior? And might we not point out to our friends, and we do have scriptural basis for everything we've said here, and all these five points we've covered today, we've had scriptural basis for them. Scriptures that actually say them. Jesus is Lord because God made him Lord. Right? And Jesus is Christ because God anointed him and made him Christ. You know, Jesus is to be worshipped by his people because God determined that that should be done. He wants him to be honored, right? Sure. And it brings glory ultimately, uh, Philippians 2 and 9, to who? To God. God himself gets honored in this. Now, if you begin worshiping Jesus as though he were God, I think we're just messing up the program, aren't we? Because now God isn't getting honored. You're giving God's honor to Jesus. This makes no sense. And you're not honoring Jesus by doing that. I think Jesus would, you know, oh my goodness, what are you doing? You know. You're, talk, you, you're worshiping me as though I'm God? Haven't you never, have you never read the, uh, the first of the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. How would that figure into this, I think? So, uh, so these, are, uh, these are wonderful and, and powerful things, I think. The idea that Jesus could never be our Savior without being God is absolutely upside down and backwards. And all you have to do is sit down some time and read Romans, the fifth chapter, and you begin to get the equation uh, exactly the way it really is. Not a verse in there, never look the obvious, not a verse in there ever says, in order to be our Savior, you had to be God. None, no, not one. Yeah, not, never going never gonna to find that. Don't have to worry about that one. You're not going to find it. But what about the being our Savior because God made him to be our Savior? Yeah. And here it is, Romans 5. Our Savior, the one God was going to use to bring us salvation, had to be, 
And here's the three words, one of us. It's very important. Do you ever think about it? It's not God that sinned, right? God didn't have to make amends to God. Who, who sinned? Who had the problem here? Humanity did, beginning with Adam and on down. We're the ones with the problem. We're the ones that have offended God. God didn't have to sort of reconcile the world to himself by himself. He had to reconcile mankind to himself through, Romans 5 is going to tell us, one who is like Adam. He's the second, if you will, the second Adam. And uh, this one, who's truly one of us, he's the one who can offer himself back to God. And because he obeyed God completely, God does accept what he has done for us, this one Jesus. So yeah, he's our savior. He is truly a man. He had to be a man. And that's what we want to begin to say to our friends is when they come saying, he had to be God because. We want to say, no, he had to be a man. I mean, think about it. To be Lord, he had to be a man that God would make Lord, right? Nobody makes God God. Uh, to be Christ, Messiah, the anointed one, he had to be a man. Not some other kind of being. He had to be a man because nobody anoints God. God has anointed Jesus, Acts 10, 38, right? With, with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay. So, uh, and, and so it goes with these other things. To, to we worship him? Yeah. But we worship him as Lord and as the anointed one that God has put over us. That means beyond a question he had to be a man. Right? Sure. And, and so it is on through. Uh, and, and so it is here. To be our Savior, interestingly enough, it's exactly diametrically uh, in opposition to what they say. He had to be God. Absolutely not. He had to be, say those three words, one of us. Those are the, those are the wonderful words, I think. In Romans 5, uh, we, we could just take a whole session and just work our way through Romans 5. It's beautiful. It, you can't miss it. It's so easy to understand. One man messed up, another man has said it right. One man disobeyed God, another man obeyed God. What does it mean to God if some God being obeys him? I would think that would not be unexpected. <laughs> you know, what would that mean? We, we have no idea. What does it mean to God if, if God resists sin? That would mean nothing. But what does it mean to God if one of us, those who have come uh, down from Adam and here in, in humanity in this state we're in, what about if one of us obeys him? Does that mean something to God? Oh, yes. And, and one of us resists sin. And unlike Adam, goes the opposite way and says, no, I'm not going to uh, dishonor, disobey my father. This time, one of us has obeyed. One of us has done this. And yes, one of us messed it up. One of us gets it right. What do you think? He had to be one of us. To be all of these things we're talking about and all the things we've talked about today. So what do you think? It's not so hard, is it? I, I, I will say this, if I may. I do believe with all of my heart, no matter what anybody does, in this end time, God is going to have a people who honor him and know him for who he is and honor his son and know him for who he is. I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. What is the greatest principle of all? Jesus is telling you in Mark 12, 29. You know, what's the, what's the biggest deal of all? Well, the fact that, that God is just one. There's only one who's God. And, and what is the foundation we're supposed to be built on? Be build, you know, Jesus says, I will build my church on this rock, this foundation. But, but, what, uh, but what is the rock? The declaration of Peter, isn't it? You are the Christ. Well, we just talked about that earlier. You are the son, not God, but the son of the living God. And he is the human son of the living God. This is wonderful. But do we need, is that small business? As we say in, uh, in, uh, in our part of the country, is that small potatoes? I don't think so. 
This is huge. This is central. Jesus is building his church. But I wouldn't want to go out here and say, oh, I'm going to hop off of the foundation that, that we're building on that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I'm going to get with you people who are over here building on some other foundation. Because really, I think when you're building on these other things, uh, Trinitarian ideas and all this, what are they building on? The, the other crowd who don't want to build on that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What are they building on? Well, they're over here saying things like, well, you know, he resisted sin. He had to be God, didn't he? Well, they're building on Jesus is something he's not. Jesus is the one who's really building his church. I'm, I'm just going to hang with him. What do you think? Stay with him. I figure he knows who he is. I figure he knows what he wants us to build on. What do you think? He is the Christ. Amen. He is the Son of the living God. He is our Lord. This is beautiful and it's easy. I'm telling you as surely as God is God, He's going to have a people who go into the kingdom of God, I believe, confessing from their hearts and with all their understanding that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And all of this turning Him into something He's not. That's just got to give way. I guarantee you people are not going to believe, be believing that in the kingdom. They won't be saying it. What do you think? Uh, absolutely not. If we can wipe away some of the layers and layers of confusion and, and tradition, the truth is really pretty simple. I've always said the truth is easy. It's the error that's hard.